Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Swabia. And this is not a video specifically based on the duchy, but we will fundamentally envelope it with the broader background. Uh, it, it is the first video dedicated specifically to Swabia, except from the pretty hefty playlist on the Hohenstaufen. I did something already about um, um, Alemannia and Alpine R Russia. In the first half of the medieval millennium, the Duchy of Swabia recurred in different titles, especially uh, some videos uh, about the sort of the political and institutional history of the German kingdom, for obvious reasons. Swabia really embodies a bit the, the honor of Germany, as far as the imperial authority, the um, the Roman legacy is concerned. It is a an enormous uh, history that today we cannot quite, in fact, address in depth, right? But we will keep talking about the Alamanni that I made one of my very earliest videos on. Of course, we have to update that. Uh, I talk about the Alamanni here and there. Anyway, they recur, right? Also in the videos about Carolingian history. So you have plenty, actually, of stuff already. Also about as you know, other chunks of Germany that now we have come to cover um, uh, in the, say, for 50 plus something percent. We will go on with that. Um, so let's simply go with uh, Swabian history from, say, the origins to the end of the Middle Ages, to Maximilian the first fundamental. Um, so if you look at the very, say, beginning, say, the Iron Age, um, you you know that the lands on the right bank of the Danube were Celtic, right, originally. They were part of the Latin culture that we discussed just recently in that video about the Celtic metallurgic legacy in the Romano-Germanic arms and armor. Um, this area was still, of course, one of frontier, right, uh, the Celtic Gaulish substrate of the country would remain historically, uh, ethnically, in spite of the Romanization, the Germanization. In Roman times, uh, that came essentially with the Rome in the, in the first centuries before Christ, uh, and so seeing consolidation also in, in the following centuries after Christ, especially as far as the so-called Agri Decumates were concerned, we will talk about the um, the Roman mil uh, limits in this area, but say, uh, you know the story. Um, the region became part of the Roman province of Rezia at large, right? As we will see, this was not called Swabia yet, and the boundaries of uh, the later Swabia that fundamentally came around as a, as a term um, to define the, the region for good internationally, historiographically, the mid Middle Ages fundamentally uh, varied over time territorially, especially with the duchy that had uh, a proper uh, political and institutional boundary. So and this came to encompass larger larger areas than even the ones originally settled by the Alemanni, as we will see now. Um, as we, we also know, the name Suebia, in Latin, derives from that of the Suebi, this Germanic um, population that fundamentally achieved the first great confederacy on the Baltic Sea, comprehending different peoples, not just what were osmotically also uh, known as the Suebi, right, as a wall. Um, it is a term used already by Tacitus in the first century AD. Um, it has more of a fact of a geographical meaning because this confederacy was so firmly established uh, over the, these other groups that as a wall the region was Suebia, right? In fact, uh, Tacitus calls notoriously the the same Baltic Sea as the Mare Suebicum, so the Suebian Sea, uh, after, by the way, the uh, the Suiones, right, it would be, again, I made a video about the, the Geats, and we'll talk about the Swedes too, but this is not 
the time to digress in this uh, philological, ethnographic, and, and historical uh, uh, excursus, let's say. However, in this, say, northern end um, of this region, so across the same sea in Scandinavia, you have the Suiones, the Sitones, and the Roman senator, historian, and ethnographer says, Ic Suebiae Finis. That is to say, that, that's where essentially Suebia ends. So that, that gives you an idea of how broad uh, the concept was, in a way. In spite of the relations that existed uh, among these peoples, the peoples we've already seen, such as the Longobards, for example, were part of the Swabian Confederacy, as we'll see now, same Alamanni, or those at least that would be called after the collapse of the Swabian Confederacy, were part um, of the same. And that's, in fact, what, what occurred. Like, in the um, second half of the second century AD, this great... Confederacy collapsed, which caused a, a huge mess that in a way contributed to put um, the Germanic peoples on the move. This is essentially also why the Marcomannic Wars were fought. There were many peoples, uh, including, for example, the same Longobards. We will see now all the, the various chunks that, uh, as a result of that, began to uh, infest um, the Roman Empire. We're talking about this very early centuries. I, I talked about this specifically in one video about Longobard history in this earlier time, like the, this, in fact, the ones of Marcus Aurelius, um, um, to be to be defeated, but still, right, to cause the major, say, the first uh, major unhinging of what had been otherwise a stable frontier for for centuries uh, with Germany. Um, this shattered the also the, the commercial relations between Rome and the Germans, and lots of stuff going on, including, essentially, from the mid-3rd century BC, the, um, say, the emanation from the former Swabian group. So th this were the Elb Germans, historically, right? So a bit like uh, linguists, sometimes you find uh, them ranked as East Germans, but that's not quite as the Goths, the Vandals, etc. When you talk about uh, the Alemanni, the Bavarians that were, okay, we can't rank them among Germanic peoples, but they were somehow more uh, uh, stemming from the from the local realities. But the same Longbirds, these were linguistically Elb Germans. Right, and as we will see now, they would maintain significant similarities later on. But the Alamanni, in fact, stamped as the core of element of the new tribal alliance, a new confederacy at the end of the day, that expanded towards the Roman Limes, essentially east of the Rhine and south of the Main, the Main affluent. The Alamanni were sometimes already in antiquity known to for because of their confederal origin as Suebi, right? So it's not really a medieval uh, novelty. It's just that the Alamanni w w was the, the international shout-out they, they gave themselves because they were also part of different groups, just like, I don't know, among the Franks there were uh, tribes, that, I don't know, the same ones that had been fighting in the, in the Battle of the Tudorburg Forest before, etc. But they, they they would eventually, because of the stabilization of their monarchies, fundamentally in a political and territorial sense, remain with these other names, right? And so with a more cohesive sort of you know central identity. Um, and uh, this is to make the long story short, because we can't quite digress even on on the reasons why Alamannia came to be known as Swabia later on. You have, in fact, the name of the land, Schwaben, as as Swabia, uh, as Swabia, etc. During that fatal 406 A.D., right, the Alamanni slash Swabi were among those who crossed the frozen Rhine. Some of them reaching as far notoriously as Galicia in uh, northwestern. Spain, in the northwestern Iberian Peninsula, establishing a kingdom of the Suebi, in fact, that would last for some time before it was fundamentally subdued by the Visigoths later on. Um, we will see that at some point, because there are interesting traces of that in Spanish-Portuguese history. In any case, um, 
the the core of the Alemanni, of course, moved into what was had been the Agri de Command, as we will see now, the boundaries. But there were other groups actually sent of them, because this is with all these Germanic peoples, we mostly think them as one block with that name, and so they settled there, okay. Not really. First of all, there were war bands. We've seen them going anywhere. Um, and actual groups um, of probably, say, also non-militarized population that, like, we, like with a Zippe style, you know, organization established somewhere else. It was true migrations that reached even Pannonia, for example, um, after the Huns uh, broke down, uh, having been defeated by a coalition of Germanic and other peoples. Uh, in the Battle of Nedau, 454. So it's a quite complex history. We will see it as far as the Alemanni are concerned because it's all very, you know, fragmented at this point. But this is when, in fact, um, Alemannia slash Swabia is established in a more firm sense as a as a monarchy, right? Even though the Alemanni were not really ruled by a single king, they... Uh, their name, their shout out, was meaning exactly this, right? All the men, right? That's the etymology, uh, stressing the fact that this group was, in fact, bound by that ideal, and the single tribal uh, leaders were considered as independent kings. Um, and the Alamanni were substantially powerful. At some point, they, they could have been the ones hegemonizing goal rather than the Franks, because, as you know, they were essentially knocking uh, each other out. There had already been the Burgundians in between. The uh, the Romans had deported them uh, in, in the southwest. Uh, but, as you know, the matter is settled at the Battle of Tolbiac of 496, which is a, a dramatically momentous um, event in European history. I made a video specifically on this in the rise of Clovis and why this um, this battle brought to not just the Christianization of the Merovingian king who basically devoted himself to God, to the Christian God um, in, um, in in the battle in which the Alamanni were about to, to take over the Franks, right, and that instead uh, were defeated uh, by this divine intervention, of course, um, one may think that Clovis had, with his uh, radically and traumatically uh, violent imperial and dynastic idea, a very different uh, mentality from this sort of more egalitarian tribal structure of the Alamanni, right? So that we know very well what essentially even the the, the other Frankish um, petty kings ended like right literally taken out by Clovis in the process so it was in order to to rule Roman Gaul at right uh, a very different system uh, to rise and to to consolidate and this essentially brought also because in the early middle ages more or less uh, resources contract what was established at the end of this migration era was maintained fundamentally for good the in fact an Alemannic subjection to the Franks, right? Except, um, in spite of the fact that the Alemanni had settled in some Romanized areas and that their women, we know it archaeologically, were particularly sensitive to uh, Roman fashion in the first um, gener uh, generations after the settlement, there was, however, a sort of... Um, moral revanchism about having been in fact brought down by the Franks that had to leave the, the Alemanni fundamentally in a decentralized um, situation they sent counts, Frankish counts to rule them but this of course married into the same Alemannic nobility and so given that the Merovingian kingdom as you know eventually split into or empire better into four different chunks that um, spent the following centuries more or less always fighting against one another. Alamannia, but also Burgundia and uh, other uh, Aquitaine, etc. Uh, remained um, substantially autonomous, right? And so, even though they were a defeated people, they recovered some of the political autonomy 
with the sort of Frankish Alemannic blend of their elites that through the Frankish model gained also an important uh, power over the freemen so that you have this process of feudalization of course um, uh, happening in the same Alemannia that however was Christianized later in part because it was a more primitive area right it was say closer to the frontier it was not just like in the richest um, Gallic heartland or right? it was in between fundamentally that world and, and Germany um, and um, this is also the reason why we essentially get some extra archaeological evidence from the Alemanni because they kept burying their um, their freemen in arms especially the aristocracy uh, and so for a longer time that Christianization would um, prohibit uh, and maintain again even in this sort of um, local character by this point we can say that the area settled by the Alemanni extended to Alsace and the Swiss plateau considered that after the people had been crushed by the Franks uh, lots of them were essentially settled as refugees slash military colonists by Theodoric uh, the Great to guard in fact the the Alpine passes to Italy against the Franks that as you know were also and, and together with the Alemanni after the um, the end of the Gothic War they, they launched those you know deep raids into Italy as far as the south where eventually the Byzantine crashed them but that for a while were definitely about this what would have done in Carolingian times essentially trying to to seize um, the Italian peninsula from from the Empire in any case I, I talked about that too in some videos about the Justinian and era there is a playlist if you're interested um, the eastern neighbors were the Bavarians the Bavari or Bayuvari you have the Franks fundamentally in the north the rest of the Gallo-Roman world in the west and in the south Odoacer, the gods, the Longobards as they succeeded one another All right. so at, at this point again the term Swabia was already uh, used right? it, it's something that uh, begins to um, be appreciated with more consistency from the 8th, 9th century uh, and Alemannia, albeit having remained prevalent up to this point starts being increasingly used to refer to Alsace specifically we'll talk about Alsatian history in, in some more specific video um, but it's in the 12th century only that you can basically see the the official name of Swabia essentially having replaced that of Alemannia uh, and so that the Ducatus Swabia fundamentally remains what uh, the land will be called uh, at the same time for the rest of its history um, always provided that of course to the, the, the boundaries of the duchy are much larger than today's uh, say Schwaben at least in the German uh, administrative districts right because you know somebody from from Baden is called a Swabian it's, it's, there is a, f a feud between those things like these but uh, of course the broader ethno-linguistic area was the one of Alemannia and so uh, Swabia later so the history of the duchy is quite fascinating we have as we we're saying at the beginning met already with it um, now and then uh, we have seen how even in the time in which the Swabian dukes are elected uh, as Holy Roman emperors the local nobility had this sense of the honor of, of their own duchy right that was something that even the the German monarch had to always negotiate with right as as a Swabian nobleman among the others in that regard this is quite fast I made a video specifically on this and Lotharingia to explain um, that 
dynamic from uh, Duchy to Dukedom, by the way. Um, so as we've seen, the Alamanni had been fundamentally crushed by uh, the Franks of Clovis I, and as such incorporated in his great empire. They were governed historically by duchess, not comites, which essentially was the difference between the Alamannia and the Franks, in a way that, this, as we've seen, these families had married into one another, but the term dux, as far as also the longer birds are concerned, other figures, is more markedly um, Germanic in, say, institutional uh, language than the more Romanized sort of uh, commas that, in fact, you can find just in gold because of the enormous uh, Roman legacy uh, in some areas, um, say, the Latin-speaking areas of the Byzantine Empire, but not uh, otherwise. Of course, there were exceptions. Eventually, the term commas is applied pretty much, you know, post-Carolingian Europe, but originally, right? During the early Middle Ages, you have the gradual conversion of the Alamanni that is fundamentally smooth, uh, thanks to this uh, decentralized position that will fundamentally render the elite Christian quite in time for cooperating with the Carolingians, say, not things like would happen like with the Saxons, for example. Um, there were bishoprics founded in the very important Alamannic centers of Augsburg and of Constance, right, so in the eastern limit and on this uh, important fact, uh, location, frontier in the Lake Constance uh, with Thurgau, and so areas that, as we will see now, towards the southwest were contended at least with the what the Burgundians fundamentally what kind of the kingdom. Burgundy made uh, multiple videos as you know on that realm. So if you're interested you can check that out. But we'll come back on this because it's it's really a, a, one of the most important and underestimated frontiers in Europe, the one essentially of, of Switzerland. Even more importantly for Alamannia and what was becoming Eastern France in a more comprehensive way was the foundation in the 8th century of the notable abbeys at Reichenau and St. Gall. This is um, particularly important for the fact that it's in these monastic um, centers that the term Teutonic begins to be thrown around for the entire Eastern Frankish Kingdom, as it would fundamentally uh, take shape uh, in the 9th century. Uh, and so here in the 8th, actually, it's slightly earlier, but of course, Alamannia belonged to the, to the Germanic world, as we've seen, uh, and it's more or less along those lines. It weren't really the single most important in the, in the way the Carolingian um, Empire was split, right? There could be different... Um, say, things going on. We've seen it especially in the video series about Lotharingian warfare where we've seen also what the role of the Swabians was in terms of military intervention, uh, etc. But what is important here is that there are elites that are beginning to uh, be affluent enough to found this major uh, abbeys that will have uh, a relevant role nationally and internationally also as the uh, connective tissue of Carolingian and post-Carolingian Europe, so also after the, say, the collapse of the empire. Uh, we can say, as we observed before, that uh, already by the 7th century, so the moment of greatest contraction, also of, of Frankish power, um, the Alamanni retained much of their former autonomy. Uh, Frankish rule was almost nominal, However, as soon as the Pepinids Arnold things came back in power with their um, brutally effective military clientele of Austrasia and recovered most, of, of course, of what was the Franks, not just the actual kingdom, but this, in fact, other um, chunks, right, of, uh, of different populations, Pepin of Heristal reconquered Alamanna in 709, 
In 730, his son Charles Martel reduced the Alemannic elite again to dependence on the Franks. And in 746, you have actually one of the most brutal chapters in Frankish history, the so-called Blood Court at Cannstatt. Um, uh, it's a place where they met uh, at the time that is now part of Stuttgart uh, city. And the interesting aspect is basically that the Franks had invited the Alemann nobility to this meeting uh, and had them all massacred. Right? And the reason being that even though, as we've seen, the Alemanni had recognized who the stronger was, they were still trying to essentially autonomize themselves. Some of these, as we've seen, had uh, Frankish ancestry, right? So uh, the the sense was they had, it's a light motive, as you know, we've seen it many times, it will happen even with kings um, uh, and sons and emperors, sons, etc., that they would essentially take the root in, in the land that were ruling. Uh, in the first place, so supporting that even against central power. Um, and this massacre was, however, very useful to reduce Alamannia um, to a much greater uh, level of Frankish control. Not being able, however, to break or to alter fundamentally the sort of ethnic sentiment of, of the people and still of the elite that uh, had not been entirely wiped out, of course, uh, not even close, but say outer Franks will arrive and the, uh, further decentralization will arrive and so similar dynamics will happen later uh, as well. Right? Pepin the Short, as you know, uh, Charles Martel's son, abolished, by the way, the uh, the, the tribal duchy and ruled Alamannia by Count Palatine or Kammerboten, um, that is to say, eliminating also that last sort of institutional uh, difference, right, with the rest of uh, Frankish dominions, it was meant to just flatten the Alamanni further into subjection. However, the importance of the Alamanni is highlighted by the same Charlemagne's marriage with the Alamannian princess Hildegard of the Vinsgau, right, was his second wife, and mother of Louis the Pious. This marriage was consumed in 771, right? So um, this is also an interesting political figure at the Carolingian court and we may we will surely encounter her again in our videos um, on that topic. Um, so at this time Alemannia was districtuated in numerous counties known is in German vernacular as Gawa, as it was the case basically for the other Germanic lands of the Empire and um, it uh, fundamentally would maintain this structure uh, throughout the entire Middle Ages. The country was also outlined fundamentally, stretched south of Frankish Austrasia, so what would become later the Duchy of Franconia, uh, needless to say all the lands bound, uh, say, bordering uh, Alemannia, especially within the eastern Frankish um, uh, dimension had very deep ties uh, with it, especially especially Bavaria, we will see it now. Um, and so the, the boundaries in, in the west was um, essentially the, the upper Rhine uh, and, um, and the Lake Constance, right? The south you would have other land. Um, in, uh, in, in the southeast you had uh, the aforementioned uh, Alpine Russia that was uh, stemming from the Rezia Kukuriensis, right, from Kur. But in the southwest you had, for example, areas like, just like in Constance, Thurgau, etc., that at some point were contended uh, with the Burgundians, as we were saying. These were more or less the um, 
the boundaries on, on the west southwest on the east you had basically um, uh, the Lech tributary of the Danube southeast also the Inn Valley uh, with Tyrol right so we will talk about that region um, as well and it was fundamentally a, a fairly well outlined area right there weren't major uh, geographical obstacles but the the valleys at, at least were you know pretty well outlined as, as, as boundaries um, the lack as we've seen separated Alemannia from the Duchy of Bavaria uh, which was however a loose frontier because um, ethnolinguistically uh, there was sort of a blur in between right and there would be a substantial um, intercommunication between the two peoples uh, there as we will see some the, the dynasties first of all were married into but just the the geographical proximity these were in southern germany also some of the areas in which um, say local literature would spread the most in later centuries um, that sense of think about the Mimizenka, the sense of chivalry um, southern Germany was richer and more developed than than the northeast actually Alemannia wasn't um, overwhelmingly at least in the especially in the southern part but it, it was still more exposed to um, to France uh, etc in the 843 treaty of Verden Alemannia was attributed to the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, right? Um, in the later Carolingian Empire, the Alamannic counts became again very autonomous, and the control of the land was disputed from the same within between the counts and the bishop of Constance. Right. This tells you how powerful, of course, ecclesiastical principalities already were in uh, at the end of, of the Carolingian era, right? And the role of say of Constance would always play a, a major factor in also the, the administration of the land from from the kings and the emperors uh, in Germany, as we will see now in the following century. Um, so at the beginning of the tenth century, it would essentially appreciate two major Alemannic lay lineages competing with one another for the rule of the land. We're talking the unfriending counts that stemmed from the aforementioned Rezia Curiensis, right? So in the south, from, from the mountains, and I made again a video talking about them as well. And the outlaw things ruling the Bar Plateau estates around the Upper Neckar and Danube rivers. These were representing essentially the two major uh, worlds within the same Alemannia, right? The, the, the former, a bit sort of more primitive, conservative um, uh, in, in the mountains, the, the latter in the lower lands right in this area close to the to the black forest right and the major uh riverways connecting it with the broader uh frankish world um the members of these of both of these lineages were sometimes called margraves right or as in the case of rudolf of Rezia, um that was by the way, belonging to the House of Wealth, branches of which uh, ruled both in Italy and in Germany, dukes, right? Um, these titles, especially during the 10th century, were not fixed right in the fully institutionalized feudal uh, hierarchical terminology, right? But they referred to still this sort of more militarized reality that bordered with, with other ones and that still retained uh, some Alemannic terminology as we've seen um, that uh, is, is evident uh, in, in, especially in the 
interland, uh, as in this case. Andly, in 903, the Unfrinding Count Burkert I was called Dux of Alamannia. Thus, the Unfrindings somehow won at this point. Except the say the, the rule right on on the on the land. Except the same guy was killed in 911, um, which um, brought, by the way, to a treason accusation to um, two Swabian counts Palatine that were originally attached to to a royal imperial um, outpost, fundamentally. We're talking about Berthold uh, and Erchanga, the latter proclaiming himself Duke of Alamanne in 950. This guy that had evidently autonomized himself also against um, the, say, the order of, of the Eastern Frankish monarch, that was Conrad I, was in fact put to death by the ruler's order in 970. This uh, doesn't oppose much in favor, of, say, of the stability of the land. Uh, that would be, in fact, quite rebellious, as we will see now, against the the monarchy that was also consistently distant uh, in its center in Germany. But that also wouldn't find quite much of a central order uh, by itself. Right. When Erkanger was executed, Burkhard II, son of the late Unfrinding Burkhard I, and Count in Rezia Curiensis, uh, took the title of Duke of Alamannia. This was achieved by the defeat of a Burgundian interference in the aforementioned Thurgau region, so just south of Lake Constance, um, which in that sense was much the pride of, of the land, because aside from the attrition between the lay and the, ecclesi- the ecclesiastical uh, aristocracy, this, they, they were essentially cooperating to an important degree. In 919, you have the Alamanni crushing the Burgundians, at the Battle of Winterthur, which also essentially put an end temporarily to the, to the claims of the uh, Burgundian king over this area. Uh, at the time, Rudolf II, we have met him in the video about, in fact, the kingdom of Burgundy. He was quite of an enterprising guy. He was both in Burgundy, Germany, uh, Italy, etc. Um, he had been able to mm, expand up to the Lake Constance from his upper Burgundian estates by, in fact, exploiting, as always, the, the political divide uh, existing between the aforementioned Halfings and uh, Umfrindings. So that was a lesson to be learned, right? Uh, Rudolf had gone as far as occupying the palace at Zurich and had in fact established uh, that with the essentially the that was the the main center of public authority in the region um, the the incursion in Turgau all right so the the feat at Winterthur brought the Burgundians to essentially abandon the same Zurich and to retreat beyond the Reuss River, forming the main valley of the Uri Canton. The victory of Winterthur essentially secured the uh, Unfrinding rule, uh, so much so that the Duke Burkhard uh, was recognized eventually by the newly elected king of Eastern Francia, that is, Henry the Fabler, right? And, as you know, lots of things were going on. Meanwhile, Saxony, from which Henry uh, came from, and uh, and Swabia are at, at the opposite ends of Germany, latitudinally. It's not that there weren't um, reasons for the Saxons to, to support uh, to recognize the, uh, the the Unfriending rule in Swabia, 
um, but it was a factor, right? Given that the Saxons were yet to rise in a more consistent and effective fashion uh, throughout this time, it was marked, as you know, by the uh, repeated and uh, devastating Magyar raids pretty much all across uh, Eastern France, and that were creating problems of the same uh, Swabians, except for the fact that as long as this went on and the Germans disagreed with one another, um, um, say a centralizing uh, monarchy did not exist, and so the local rulers could autonomize further until it was just too much, and as you know, the Battle of Blackfield was fought at the, at the same boundaries of Swabia and, uh, and Bavaria. And that tells you how close uh, those, say, the, the Magyar incursions were. But they were pretty much all over the place. Um, thus, Burkhardt, Duke of Swabia, was virtually independent, right? When he died in 926, he was succeeded by Hermann, uh, the first Conradine Duke of Swabia, uh, essentially a Franconian nobleman, right? who married Burkhardt's widow. Um, Hermann was, by the way, the son of Gebhard, Duke of Lorraine, and a cousin of the same King Conrad I of, of Germany. So we're talking really the, the highest elite of, of the country that is sort of coming together also because of the rise of the milites, of the, the military class proper that, as you know, in Europe was being engineered from the very blood and soul of these of these lands, um, and um, Erman died in 948. At this point, the current uh, king of Germany, Otto the first, Otto would be the the great, gave the Duchy of Swabia to his own son Ludolf, who is famous for having rebelled, in fact, to his father as Duke of Swabia. Uh, Ludolf had married Hermann's daughter, Ida, so this ensured him some significant inheritance rights in front of the local uh, nobility. However, Otto used his son's position to reduce the Swabian ducal privileges and even appointed Count Palatine to... Uh, essentially check his own son's um, policy, right? So this was a sort of dynastic um, change that was masking uh, an attempt for further control and centralization, a reason for which Ludolf, supported by the Swabian nobility, revolted against his father, who defeated and deposed him, and he appointed other dukes who followed in quick succession. You have Burkhard III, who was the son of Burkhard uh, II, the Unfrendings, uh, from 954 to 973, uh, that um, essentially ruled after Ludolf, a son that was Otto, the first of, of Swabia, all right? Uh, that, uh, as a member of the Ottonian dynasty, however, uh, called right, uh, for his part of the inheritance of the Swabian duchy as the son of former duke, then you have, um, he would become actually also Duke of Bavaria uh, later on. In 982, you have uh, Conrad I, a relative of Duke Hermann I, ruling until 997. You have Hermann II, member of the Conradine dynasty, who died in 1003. Uh, he was followed by Hermann III, his son, um, that ruled until 1012, right? Um, and throughout this time, in spite of all, uh, the Swabian dukes remained loyal to the Ottonians, right? Uh, this happened because fundamentally they had been hammered down during the 
the revolt, um, there were, of course, moments of tension, some dukes rebelling, being deposed, etc. But um, overall, right, you had there uh, the, the empire taking form, the Ottonians quite reshaping the entire sense of imperial identity from a Saxon one to, to, to a Roman one, truly, uh, again, uh, and uh, Swabia didn't have alone the, the capacity right, to challenge uh, this, this order uh, at the time, and as you know, the, the rest of the kingdom's history was effectively about a, a balance between the, the stem duchies, right, with one, of course, uh, providing with the, the monarchic uh, house, but, and, and of course, uh, the stronger power, but not being able to get past the elective system and creating a functional national monarchy like, like in France or England. At least this is something that had it was still feasible and possible, but there were lots of things going on of which this where stem duchies were taking advantage, such as the the, the investiture controversy and uh, the, the various other wars that engulfed the country uh, for a long time. The aforementioned Herman the Third um, died childless, so that the Duchy of Swabia passed to Ernest II, a member of the House of Babenberg, as he was the son of Hermann's old, uh, uh, oldest sister, Gisela, and in fact Ernest I, Margrave of Austria. Right? Uh, Ernest I held the Duchy of Swabia for his son, until his own death in 1015. Um, Gisela undertook the government and th at that point and she married again with Conrad, Duke of Franconia, that would have become the future German King Conrad II. Um, so, of course, this tells you how important Swabia was as a, in, in the broader German royal policy, right? Except you have the, the sort of dynastic uh, discontinuities and so definitely uh, the the evidence of how powerful the elites had become in the country and trying to affect remaining as much as they could above even the, the, the local nobility that did have of course uh, uh, a role against the same say uh, for defending their own autonomies within the same duchy I made a video about Conrad II, his life and times, if you want to know what, what Germany was like at the time, and also in a quite crude way, socially and politically, I, I, I advise you that. Um, so you see an important connection between Swabia and Franconia and Bavaria, right? So these are basically the old High German uh, lands, the ones that somehow, again, were more developed of all. Uh, Franconia made a video on it and bought it the uh, the imperial uh, grandeur of the Frankish legacy southern Germany just was historically more developed um, it was warmer it had been Romanized it was closer to civilization so it was to evolve into something more uh, consistent um, when the aforementioned uh, Ernest the second came of age, he actually quarreled with his stepfather, who had him deposed, um, and in 1030 gave the duchy to Gisela's second son, Hermann IV. He died in 1038, and the duchy passed then to Henry, that was his own son by Gisela. Henry was none the less than Henry the uh, Third, known as the Black the Pious, Holy Roman Emperor from 1046 to his death in 1056. Right, he had become King of Germany in 1045, um, and he, given his imperial role, granted Swabia to 
uh, Otto II that was a member of the Azonid dynasty, um, Count Palatine of uh, Lotharingia from 1034 and uh, in fact Duke of Swabia from 1045 to his death. In 1047 after him you have the following year Otto III known as the White uh, Count of Schweinfurt, Margrave of Nordgau. After him you have Rudolf Count of Rheinfelden um, that uh, followed his brother-in-law the Emperor Henry IV at some point but became anti-king in 1077 uh, marking, by the way, the outbreak of the Great Saxon Revolt, uh, and so uh, bringing new troubles to, to the kingdom. It's very instrumental to the rise of the Hohenstaufen that were already there was exactly the fact that uh, while, of course, the, the rebels were mostly based in Saxony, so from the other uh, part of Germany, even though there were others somewhere else, including in Swabia, um, the majority of the Swabian aristocracy supported uh, Henry IV, that at that point was really isolated, so much so that the rise of uh, the Hohenstaufen is connected exactly um, with this. Henry IV gave his daughter Agnes to his faithful adherent, Frederick I, uh, Count of Hohenstaufen and Duke of Swabia from 1079 to his death. Right, he is considered the first ruler of the House of Staufer uh, and how to introduce these. Um, I made so many videos about the Hohenstaufen and uh, I uh, really uh, advise you to give a look at them if you want to know more. Of course, the, the dynasty's uh, reach went far beyond Swabia, but it it's sprang from there and, let's say, a bit all the imperial mystique of the German rule revolves around the uh, Swabian inheritance, right? The Golden Age, the moment in which truly um, Germany was the strongest power in Europe in the second half uh, of the 12th century, um, a sort of cursed dynasty if you realize how things ended in the 13th century, but that really went the closest to achieve the reunification of East and West, uh, the control of Europe and the Mediterranean, uh, and so really um, an epopee of, of heroic proportion and uh, still a lot is being written uh, about them. You have some of the greatest works in um, 20th century historiography such as Kantorovic, uh, Frederick II, and you have even stuff written by um, there's Abulafia, but in, in general the more we dig on Frederick II the more we um, discover still in a sense and as you know 19th century German nationalism was complaining about the fact that the Hohenstaufen were more projected towards towards Italy, the Mediterranean, and so pursuing this imperial chimera, whereas you know, the true hard stock of the Saxons, of the northern Germans led by the Welfen, were expanding towards the Baltic, uh, the north, uh, founding the, the Anseatically, etc., and so giving a sort of more national uh, character to Germany that, however, in this sense, lost um, for sure, right, the, the, the possibility of, a, of becoming a national monarch because all the resources were surely spent um, elsewhere, right, by, especially in the great campaigns of Frederick Barbarossa and, and his grandson Frederick II. But that objectively was the, the most sensible thing to do. Right, and I will not digress now why that is the case, but I think it's self evident why you would like to um dominate from Rome or Sicily. Uh and yes, making Germany essentially just a province of, of this, except 
that of course uh, these rulers did feel very much their in Roman imperial duty in as much as they were Germans and Swabians especially uh, in this case so it's really um, I want to do really a lot of videos about uh, this topic because it's one of the single most important uh, in uh, in history it's a bit old the middle ages in two damned I think that uh, I, I always say this because otherwise I feel guilty but um, uh, I, I do really appreciate Anglo-Saxon historiography as for what it has represented in the second half of the 20th century but there is no doubt that aside from say what started happening from the 70s etc say our culture has been informed by mostly what of a sort of British centric view of basically of all of history like if you if, even if you ask AI right they're going to talk about the, the Middle Ages in general and it's just about Hastings and it's about uh, the Wars of the Roses and it, it, and you realize that there is a mass like say it's not that that's not important of course but that in proportion there are equally or even more important things um, that do not get represented at all right many people use this sort of anti-anglocentric narrative to push multiculturalism all this stuff by saying ah because outside of europe there were other things if you have if you look within the same europe you will find much more amazing things that existed anywhere else in many ways and i think this is one of the most crucially and um, unjustifiably underappreciated um, moments in European history and, and the Hohenstaufen are really the protagonists uh, of this all and we really need to make uh, a bit about the role of the Germans in the Renovatio Imperi and their relation with Rome because um, first of all you wouldn't understand why the, the German battle cry was something like here is Rome we are we are Rome right why the Ottonians chose to shift ethnically from a, an institutionally Rome, a German to a Roman one um, for the Empire, what, what the Empire meant to them and for them in connection with Augustus, with Caesar uh, because th the meaning of Europe is exclusively about this right? And there is not an alternative another vision we have to reflect on it, for anyone who knows traditional history this is like literally the explicit ABC of what these people believed in and I made several videos stressing this but we will keep going on but how to introduce even the Staufe I mean we can keep it simple to the to the Swabian dimension because of course the history of the Empire at this point eludes um, the focus of this video in any case um, Frederick the uh, first had to fight still for the control of Swabia because imagine the entire country engulfed um, and finally also defeated in a broader sense at least as a as a monarchy by the conquered that of Worms that basically recognized the papacy the right to um, say primal um, investiture of the bishops in Italy uh, and considered that Swabia we've seen it in the video about the duchy the, the du from duchy to dukedom um, was very connected with Italy with with Lombardy Swabia geographically speaking actually extended up to say the duchy extended up to Chiavenna for south right so up to common almost so you have um, obviously enough this explains in part also why the orange stuff and were so uh, much into the were favored right as far as uh, an Italian intervention was was considered that's why they tried later to even cash the entire southern Germany by um, trying to uh, dynastically inherit the the Duchy of Austria uh, I made a video on all of those already so by the way you can check that out so creating this macro southern German state that would control the Alpine passes and so having uh, just by demographics uh, agriculture just trade connection strategic potential that a, a dramatic upper hand on central and southern European affairs um, um, in any case um, 
that's the point, right? They had chosen the losing side because they had real because they had were close to Franconia, right, to the Salian dynasty. Uh, they managed to marry, as we've seen, the same daughter of, of the Holy Roman Emperor. And the Hohenstaufen were not, however, particularly powerful individuals. This is something like, like the Habsburgs later. They rose from relative, um, say, not nothingness, but almost, right, in terms of who was the, the more powerful. Like the Ottonians in proportion, even if they were also a bit like newcomers, they, they had much greater prestige from, from since the beginning, um, or almost. These guys here just managed to exploit the situation dramatically well. They had to fight against Berthold that was the Duke or uh, the, the son of the Duke and anti King Rudolf Reinfeld and that would maintain some foothold in uh, in Swabian and against the same Frederick's son in law, Berthold the second Duke of Zeringen this was an important Swabian uh, lineage that had really rivaled with, with the same Hohenstaufen in the, in the west um, of, of the duchy. Um, and f given the latter's power, especially Frederick, was to cede to Berthold uh, Breis the Breisgau province in 1096. It's one of my favorite vacation places, by the way, Freiburg especially, but not only, there's plenty of history there. Um, Frederick II succeeded his father in 1105. Uh, this would be, uh, we were talking about Frederick II as Duke of Swabia, like that's what the numeral says, right? This was actually Frederick I, Frederick Barbarossa's father. He was known as the One-Eyed because he um, st struggled for uh, the the same throne of Germany during the, the various elections, and uh, he was blinded uh, in one eye uh, by by a hit by and and this was against the law of physical integrity, right? Because if you had this sort of handicaps you could not you had to be a, a true warrior like a perfect one so if this had happened to you it was not much a matter of physical prowess or not these guys were able to fight um also definitely without an eye um but um it, it was seen as a as a as a mark of moral inferiority i mean you had to be a you had been a loser basically in that dimension and so how could you be the emperor that had to to transfigure the world through its own conquest, right? It was, um, nobody was expecting his eye to regrow, right, in that. Because that's literally how they thought, at least the, ideally, the transfigurational capacity was. Um, however, for better or for worse, this was actually how uh, the Hohenstaufen dynasty came to be, maybe, I don't know, if Frederick had not been blinded, the Hohenstaufen would have succeeded, this is what I meant. Um, but he spent the rest of his life quite diligently to build castles in Swabia for his heir, Frederick III of Swabia, better known as Frederick Barbarossa, Frederick I as Holy Roman Emperor. All right. I made multiple videos about the rise of, of Frederick uh, uh, to the say, to, given his background he was m of mixed in fact uh, Swabian and Welfen origin by the way and this um, seemed to finally bring uh, some relief to a, to a situation of uh, tension of, of war of instability in Germany he had been with his uncle Conrad III in the Third Crusade, right? So, of course, the Hohenstaufen at this point had entered, as we've seen in the club of the uh, of the of, of royalty, you know, where in another. But it's really very important to observe, just as for the Saxons, the Franconians, etc., that all the major in, uh, imperial houses of Germany emerged 
um, during the high middle ages specifically uh, because of this relentless work of encastellation by uh, the fathers of those who eventually would become rulers right uh, sort of Philip II and Alexander III of Macedon relations. So you can see it with Henry the Fowler, uh, with Otto I, you can see it with in fact Frederick II with Frederick III. And this is what matters in Germany, private patrimonial assets, right? But there is no such thing like a functional state beyond the, fundamentally the, the, uh, the imperial diet that is an elected system. Um, in nature, and it's incredibly complicated to centralize from a kingdom like Germany that that is even yet to be f feudalized the, fully in in the in the French way, which is what actually Frederick does, and and that, however, he uses immediately and coherently to actually try to subdue the rich uh, cities of Lombardy, right? But ending up spending, in fact, an enormous amount of resources to ultimately end uh, in failure. Now, um, the the earlier Hohenstaufen, Barbarossa increased the imperial domain in Swabia, because automatically when these dynasties rose to power, that basically what became a sort of public uh, asset, right? Uh, it was theirs, they controlled it privately still, but it was sort of clothed now by the sense that we are also the emperors, right? So we are more important, of course, in these possessions than the others. Um, Swabia was, generally speaking, cooperative with the uh, with the Hohenstaufen in their imperial uh, project. Of course, there was much to gain, right, from that. Um, ecclesiastical influences were very strong. Right, we think that uh, essentially the the also the the general obedience that Swabia had showed after Otto the First rebellion was provided uh, by uh, by most of the ecclesiastical lords of the land that mediated patiently, etc., between the center and the periphery. In 1152, uh, Frederick the first gave the duchy of um, of Swabia to his kinsman, right? Uh, the, the Frederick the Fourth, right, of all stuff. It was essentially Frederick's cousin, right, Barbarossa's cousin. Uh, Frederick the Fourth was the Count of Rothenburg, Obertauba, as well as Duke of Franconia, by the way. So you understand the, the power of these individuals. Um, the Frederick IV died in 1167, so that the Swabian duchy was held eventually by the emperor's three sons, the youngest, whom Philip, was chosen as German king in 1198. Um, we've seen the struggle for his coming to power as basically his brother Henry um, the, her, the, it's Henry the Sixth, like the successor of Frederick Barbarossa to the imperial throne um, had died the year prior and uh, during the struggle for the throne contended famously enough with Otto of Brunswick by, by the way um, his, um, his nephew for the young Frederick the Second um, um, was was in Sicily under the essentially the the guardianship of uh, some German knights um, that were actually very you know self interested but not only also under uh, as a an adoptive son of Innocent the Third which was sort of the positive sign of the story uh, purchased support by large sessions of uh, Swabian lands. Right, and the duchy thus remained in the royal hands also after he, Philip was famously assassinated, not by his rival actually, it was a completely random and personal issue. In fact, Otto the Fourth that raised to, uh, rose to power had the, the the killer killed right in turn because it was a huge deal. Right, the guy had been elected as 
um, king of the Romans, and um, and true uh, after the Battle of Bouvines and uh, the the rapid demise of Otto the Fort, the Duchy of Swabia passed finally to Frederick the Second in twelve fourteen. Uh, it, should be, it should be noted that, albeit Frederick the Poor Apulia uh, was, of course, based in Sicily and he ruled from it, from, it, from there, uh, he had a very high sense of his uh, Germanness and and especially as a as a German king, right? And so uh, he felt very much for the Duchy of Swabia. He loved Alsace. That he said it was his his favorite. German land. Um, Frederick, however, had again to rule in Italy, and so he granted Swabia as a collegial title. This is how they, the Hohenstaufen used to do, right? Also, Frederick um, Barbarossa had associated Henry VI to his throne before his death in, in the uh, in the Third Crusade. Uh, uh, before I said Frederick I had gone to the to the Third Crusade, like with his uncle, was obviously the second, right, the Crusade of Damascus. Um, in any case, um, he, Frederick II, conferred his, uh, say, the Duchess of Swabia to his son, Henry VII, who had a pretty dramatic story, given that he rebelled, right, he was um, essentially won over by the uh, the German nobility that was in the 13th century, especially after the the tormented uh, succession crisis, Frederick's minority autonomized themselves dramatically. Also, the Church had began, the Church of Germany, right, important allies such as the the Archbishop of Cologne, had basically been on the side of the Emperor. Like, all well, if you look at the expeditions of Frederick Barbarossa in Italy, those were all. Ecclesiastical ministerialis, whereas in the, his army force, um, began to autonomize themselves privately as princes of Germany. And th this was a substantially advanced process when Henry rebelled and his father had to come to Germany and to reassert uh, rule. Right? Um, we are, the rebellion is in 1235. Uh, and uh, Frederick entrusts at that point uh, the rule to his other son Conrad, the, the future Conrad the Fourth uh, of Germany. In in the same year, that is 1237, Frederick issues famously enough the Edictum in Favorem Principum, that was basically a, a charter selling public rights. Basically, Frederick had realized that. German policy, like the, the the project of a centralized national market was failed for good um, and he basically sold public rights in the rest of Germany to strengthen his position in Swabia and also trying to do what I was saying before with Austria right, if it was possible, so acting just like a first among equal and bailing out of, of the now dysfunctional to say the least um, public mechanism um, we know how the story goes, like also the various branches of the Hohenstaufen, they also somehow ended in a pretty disastrous way. He the rebel Henry was imprisoned by his father, he contracted leprosy, and he likely took his own life while he was moving from a castle, a prison to another, uh, throwing himself with his donkey off of a uh, cliff in Calabria. Um, the Heinz of of um, of Swabia, king of Sardinia, as his father had created him, uh, was defeated at Fossalta by the Bolognese, captured, and he spent the rest of his life in prison uh, in in the in the Guelph city. Um, and it, it's a total mess in many ways. Uh, you know what happened to the young Conradin, the 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 son of Conrad the Fourth, right? Uh, who had remained, uh, say, underage when his father, that had gone to Italy to recover his own, his own kingdom, um, died. Right, while well, Manfred was ruling in Sicily and usurping the same Conradin's um, rights. Right, uh, Manfred was taken out, 
at uh, the Battle of Benevent by the Angevins, Conradin was captured and beheaded after Tagliacozzo two years later in 1268. Um, and by by will of the Pope, by the way, they, they wanted to extirpate properly the Olenstaufen stock as such, and they succeeded in, in male line. Um, this was terrifying at the end of the in, uh, Imperial um, Swabian Parabola, all right? Um, but there is more as far as, let's say, the, the future of Swabia is intended. Because, of course, uh, there was a very heavy blow received by uh, such uh, such circumstances. Literally, the Hohenstaufen went extinguished. Um, but there was another Swabian uh, house a less important one, but also very noble ancestry, so much so that by genealogy we know, we, we just miss one ring of the chain. Otherwise we know that the Habsburgs, right, it, uh, just as the Owens all learn, and as we'll see others, were Sw of Swabian origin, so that's also why the pride of this land comes from, uh, descended from the Romano-Burgundian aristocracy, right, in, in late antiquity. This is mind-blowing if you think about that. I may have just started a series on the Habsburgs, by the way, but we uh, it deals mostly with modern history. We have to dwell a bit more into the, the medieval side of it, because it's really beautiful. And I, I wrote, by the way, a, a master test of um, 260 pages on 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 the Battle of Markfeld, so you know that I'm a bit partisan here. Um, but aside from that, um, the Rudolf of Habsburg, the little count of Habsburg. The, the Habsburgs had basically, a bit like the the Hohenstaufen with the Salians, grown uh, in favor as a as a vassal, as a Swabian vassal of, of the Hohenstaufen. Frederick II had been Rudolf's godfather, by the way. So this tells you how close they really were. Um, Rudolf had been entrusted by the same Conradin with say, the, the administration, important parts of Swabia. Um, Rudolf's brother had died uh, in, in Lombardy uh, during the wars against the, uh, the local league in the army of Frederick II. So that's how soaked into the, um, the Hohenstaufen uh, myth the the Habsburgs were and how much of course in Germany even those who fought against the the Swabians had felt of course what kind of power this land had had um, the circumstances that brought Rudolf to power are notorious he was chosen essentially because he was not a very powerful individual but he managed to just seize basically the entire southeastern Germany from Ottokar II of Bohemia a lot of a lot of stuff right we can't quite talk about this so he shifted his power east de facto um, and not really having a full control in Swabia because this this land began to exhaust itself to fragment after the exhaust uh, the, the the extinction of the Olenstaufen right uh, the local nobility was uh, really trying to seize everything as possible in this vacuum of power known as the Great, uh, the great Interregnum, um, was not such a apocalyptic uh, phase as also the German, let's say, the German nationalist uh, historiography wanted to make. Actually, the early Habsburgs even had a, a massive power after they seized Austria and uh, Styria, etc. Um, they, they were even able to uh, set things right. But Swabia was not the place from which to do this, right? Um, the first thing he actually did, as far as the Swabian estates were concerned, as he became king of the Romans, was to confiscate the f uh, former Hohenstaufen possessions as imperial property of the Holy Roman Empire, right? Um, this was a way to hopefully ensure control on, on, on those territories that still did count significantly. Um, also, 
and this would have really an important uh, consequence for the history of religion as we will see now he um, declared most of the cities formerly belonging to the Hohenstaufen to be Freie Reichsstädte, that is to say free imperial cities and essentially the, the, the core of them until the 19th century was concentrated in in Swabia right F from Rudolf's time he was mostly occupied of course in the east but also he destroyed as much as 70 castles in the Rhineland right to battle against the the rebel uh, nobility uh, etc um, the um, there were also many uh, abbeys right powerful ones in Swabia that he turned into imperial abbeys right so he tried to secure that that land like that even though the future lay east right so this mechanism brought to the so-called Reichslandvogtei that is to say um, a process of decentralization through advocacy right that was tending to, to merge all these territories um, uh, on say ruled on behalf of the um, of the Habsburgs that were centered at that point in Austria so this took different um, steps in the Holy Roman Imperial institutional eater that as you know was complicating itself I'd say it was actually simplifying itself but there were always this kind of uh, exceptions institutionalized because it was understood with also with the, the mid 14th century crisis that um, and also this sort of um, loss in power of the Habsburgs towards the same time right with other dynasties actually coming into power see the Luxembourgs etc um, to, to become part of this sort of very mosaic like um, imperial uh, establishment right um, this um, imperial chivalry was given as imperial pawn to the Duke Leopold III of Austria an Habsburg in 1379 to Sigismund of Habsburg um, Archduke of Austria in 1473-1486 um, he even took uh, the title of Prince of Swabia uh, as a local governor right and so he would this would integrated with the shrivelty of Swabia in what was becoming within the the Habsburgic possessions the realm of further Austria outer Austria and and I talked about this um, in, in the video about the Habsburgic Arab Lenda and how they had formed but let's say Swabia was um, there were other notable powers forming in it Baden for example um, in any case, um, the uh, the Habsburgs did maintain some of these lands for till the end of, of their history. And aside from the Swiss, uh, say conquests that we will talk about, because we still have to make a full comprehensive video like this on the Swiss Confederacy. That's what further Austria would have remained which gave of course the Habsburg an important foothold however in a fundamentally um, fragmented and now decentralized relatively an important area compared to where the center of power that was laying mostly in the east of Germany um, this is interesting because there would be so much to say about for example the Habsburgic relation with I don't know Savoy right with the same com Swiss confederates as we were remembering um, we will see this all in, in detail talking uh, in dedicated videos because it's really too much but to make the long story short Swabia really isolated in a sense right the grandeur the power the the wealth the prosperity that it had uh, in, in the 13th century relative terms were not to be recovered right it's as if again after this great empire you have an exhaustion and an hyper fragmentation exactly where 
power had once been the strongest. Right? Because of the aforementioned process of freeing of the, the former um, Hohenstaufen uh, cities by Rudolf of Habsburg, uh, there was a new formation in Swabia and that was the one of the League of Cities. F first formed on November the 20th, 1331. Um, this process is quite interesting because the, the freed cities of the Empire were technically as such because there was no one hierarchically between them and the Emperor. Right, so if you messed up with them, you messed with the em messed up with the emperor. What happened, however, more practically, a bit as we've seen in, also in Lombardy uh, in the previous centuries, is that these cities would form into leagues, and so albeit um, differently, for example, from uh, the Italian case, the cities were not really states. Right, they didn't have a an interland. Right, outside of their city gates, it ba was basically the bishop or the or the prince that ruled, right? This is typical, right? But altogether, as markets, as you know, communities that had in this also this proximity um, to support one another, etc., they would become defensively important bulwarks of for their own rights. Um, there were also the Rhine League uh, cities, importantly enough. In a sense, the Swiss Confederates were about this as well. There were cantons, cities, etc. Um, this reflects how, let's say, the lack of a true center in Western Germany, that in some parts was actually one of the most developed parts, but that, in fact, had not found a political cohesion as much as the, let's say, the Austrian possessions, the Bohemian ones. There are reasons for this. We have really to talk much more in depth about German history because uh, it may not be that evident why, say, uh, say rulers went far east in the empire to centralize from there as opposed to the richest areas in, in the west. Right? Think about the Luxembourgs, literally for coming from the French part of the empire, going to, to rule among the Bohemians. Right? Um, but it had to do with this very thickly inter intricated feudal uh, forest and the fact that the same German monarchy had not had the resources anymore to centralize uh, from there and that paradoxically was easier to develop the from um, relatively more in fact underdeveloped area like the the, the eastern ones um, because they had not known the full um, development of feudalism as in the West, right? So it, this is also how, when Germany is starting to lag behind in terms of uh, properly of, an, of a true institutional development. Because yes, you have the empire, but as we have seen, nobody until the 19th century was really going to rule on this, um, and. Um, you know, if not from those, uh, say, their own respective regional possessions, right? So uh, it's all very complicated. Um, the Swabian League of Cities had been established, as we've seen, in 1331, in order to support the Emperor Louis IV, the Bavarian, of Wittelsbach, uh, who uh, returned them with the promise not to mortgage any of them to any imperial vassal, which is not really much of a friendly, <laughs> you know, it's more like a threat, like say, uh, um, raising a, tr say, taking away a threat, rather. Um, and this was a way to, to maintain balance, after all, for both involved. Among the, f the founding cities, there was Augsburg in the very east, but also Heilbronn, Reutlingen, Ulm, right? These were, say, if you, if you haven't, visit them because they were really beautiful, beautiful mm, centers. 
There were, however, also lay powers, of course, such as the counts of Württemberg, Oettingen, and Hohenberg, right, that gravitated around the League and even joined them in, in 1340, right. In 1372, you have, however, the defeat of the City League by the Count Eberhard the Second, the Rainer of Württemberg, which brought to the rearrangement of this league in one of 14 cities on July the 4th, 1376. At this point, the emperor was not willing to recognize this newly revitalized Swabian League because, first of all, they had somehow lost much of that previous power to also to make leverage in there. And on the contrary, um, given that the the cities, as we've seen, were just autonomizing themselves without too much um, concern um, for, you know, outer authority at that point, especially in that position. There was a true um, Reichskrieg fought against the League by the Emperor. The Swabian League managed to clumsily defeat the same imperial army at the Battle of Reutlingen on May the 14th, 1377. However, this was just, you know, an accident of war. Um, the Burgrave Frederick V of Hohenzollern, the Burggraf of Nuremberg, um, that had come from this very lens, but as you know, passed from Nuremberg to further north, finally defeated the League uh, at Döffingen in 1388. But it was quite of a journey, like it showed the degree, especially at that point, like it, this was one of the lowest moments, say, of, say, political disintegration of the empire. In fact, the, uh, say, the imperial authority had fallen. Then, uh, the following year, however, the Swabian League disbanded, um, as they had been as part of the, let's say, the, the conditions dictated, in fact, at the Reichstag at Ege. And this was basically the end of it. Um, as we were saying before, Swabia was just um, a bomb of dynasties. The Hohenstaufen, the Habsburgs, the Hohenzollern, the, the latter two still existing, right? And this, uh, this makes you think, of course, but you have also the Dukes of Württemberg and the Margraves of Baden uh, in the, within the same Swabia, of course, continuing um, for, say, for a long time to exist. The Welf family that had once, as we've seen, also been in Swabia went on to rule in Bavaria and Hanover, right? So much so that as ancestors of the British royal family uh, since 1714, right, till today. Um, there are, of course, certain branches that uh, rose and fall, of course, that were important at, at some point, other fell. We have st still today branches of the Montfort and the Oenhams, uh also the, the Furstenberg. Um, so you, you realize that this stemmed also from the fact that just like why is there so much German royalty all right? um, uh, ancestrally because they were very fragmented areas so they produced very different uh, dynasties that could be drawn from like if you didn't have anything better <laughs> in a way um, this was one of the reasons but it's just the fragmentation of, of Swabia itself that um, was a precondition for this uh, in the first place, you had these principalities, the free cities, you have the ecclesiastical uh, lordships, you have counts, knights, so this is all what constitutes normally the, the institutional picture of late medieval or early modern Germany. Importantly enough, the Habsburgic Emperor Maximilian I reformed the Holy Roman Empire in 1512 by establishing the so-called imperial circles, so administrative groupings whose primary purpose was the 
uh, organization of defensive structure, the collection of imperial taxes. Um, and um, the, say, what was former Swabia, right, fundamentally became the Swabian Circle. Uh, importantly enough, some say the the Austrian say the, the Habsburgic territories uh, the stretched contiguously through Tyrol, by the way, until there, right, were considered something separated. Also, there was the Swiss cons Confederacy, right, south of Lake Constance. So, was a, the Swabian uh, Circle was a bit squeezed, right? You had um, the the upper Rhenish circle that also encompassed some lands of the former um, Swede, etc. So this is maybe complicated. You had the Bavarian circle that uh, stretches um, until almost Ulm, right? You have again ecclesiastical principalities that do not belong actually to the circle because this is a lay thing, right? You can have, say, fiefs that. Um, imperial fifths granted to ecclesiastical lords, but uh, the the church let's say maintains its own territories. Of course, um, this um, reform is uh, is interesting because you, you have there outlined the county of Württemberg um, already. You did Margrave of Baden. Um, you have even in. Bavaria, it's a in um, say Swabia, some parts of the uh, western territories of the Bavarian Kingdom, at least. Um, so there is some uncertainty sometimes, even in the modern internet, even the modern German boundaries of the various land that do not literally correspond to the historical regions as well. There is so-called Bavarian Swabia uh, with its capital at Augsburg that is uh, Swabian historically and then but this is um, uh, say something we will see for something more complex again I apologize for any sort of, it seems like I'm adding notions but not getting to the point but this is the point <laughs> Yeah, it's this total mess actually in terms of political fragmentation but that is exactly the product of this country's history, which, again, you, you see how unique, in spite of the similarities, the dynamics that these countries undergo, this, this, um, the, all these various lands are, right? So that's also why I make these videos. And we will surely keep talking about other lands, we will keep talking about Swabia, about the Alamanni, uh, all in due time. God allowing, um, considering that uh, there is really a lot to do and uh, and about so many different places and times, so sometimes it is exhausting, but it, I think it's worth it, uh, and it's funny especially, which which is very important. Um, in any case, uh, for today I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoy it this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye